All right, welcome everybody. This is our fifth tour of the orchestra presentation uh, with the Terre Haute Symphony and uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. I'm uh, excited to introduce to you one of our violinists with the orchestra, Toby Elser. Uh, he's actually going to be playing a more prominent role in our December concert. He's going to be the principal second violinist, so we're excited to have him in that position. Uh, today he's going to give a uh, short discussion about the violin and also perform some excerpts um, and a solo for us. So I hope you enjoy. I'm going to hand it off to Toby so he can tell you a little bit about himself. Great. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm Toby. I um, just finished my master's at uh, the Jacob School of Music here in Bloomington. Um, and I play in the Terre Haute Symphony. The whole time. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm playing um, a bunch of stuff for you guys at the end. But um, before I get into that, I want to just talk a little bit about the violin. I know that Philip did a presentation on the cello um, last week or, or previously. So um, uh, I think it's so cool that they're all related. Uh, if, you, if you trace back to the 15th century, you can find all, all kinds of different um, links between these instruments. So in the diagram here, you see um, a bunch of different sizes of instruments. Hi, can you and hear me? Yes, I can hear hmm. you, whoever that is. Well, <laughs> if everyone could put your microphones on mute yeah. so that we can make sure we can hear Toby. Yeah, um, so the, okay. the main difference between the modern violin family and what this is, which is the viola de gamba family, is that uh, these instruments were played upright like this, like, like this. And um, the, as you can see from the diagram, there were many different sizes. So uh, over time, the violin sort of crept, or the violin relatives crept up the body until now we play it here, resting on our shoulder. Um, but uh, there were there were many different sizes, not not just these four. There were there were seven different sizes, usually six strings. Sometimes there were many many more, um, and uh, they kind of phased out of popularity in the mid 18th century. But they're still used today, um, occasionally, but just not not so much in orchestras anymore. Um, and uh, the other family that was developed. Uh, a little bit later in the 16th century was this, which is much more familiar to us today. This is the viola de Bracchio family. You could call it the modern violin family. As you can see, the violin, which is the smallest, is the one on the left there, the double bass being the biggest on the right. Um, and uh, unlike the, the gamba family, the violin family always has four strings, and there are only four of them. So. Um, and uh, they are very popular today, uh, still. So, so just a little brief history lesson there. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the violins. I made a little diagram. Um, uh, forgive me if it's kind of hard to read, but the, basically the, I don't know where to start, the scroll, the top here, the peg box, these are all just, um, uh, helpful for, for figuring out the anatomy of, of the instrument. Um, yeah, you can go through this, Toby. This is this okay. kind of, this not matches sure, up I'm with not sure what, the detail I should go into. Okay. So no, this, this cool. matches up with what Philip did, and you've got actually a few other parts labeled here that he didn't have. So go ahead and go through this. Okay, cool. Here. So the scroll, I'm going to hold it up to the camera so you can sort of see. Uh, my desk is in the way, but basically you can see how it sort of swirls like that. And that's very common for any uh, instrument of the violin family. Um, inside the scroll, we see this, this compartment where all the strings are kept. Um, and the strings are rolled around these pegs. I don't know if you can see these pegs on the side here. And the pegs are uh, make what's called the peg box, which is where basically we do any of the tuning. So I'll give a little demonstration of tuning. So I take I take the peg here, and I I secure with my the rest of my hand back here, and I and I'm able to change the pitch by just moving the peg here. Um, 
Um, so moving down the, from the top to bottom, um, we have the neck, which is this, um, uh, which is this area from the top of the violin to the scroll. So this is called the neck right here. Um, on top of the neck, so this, this wood underneath, you can see the difference in material. The bottom part, the lighter material is the neck, the top part is the fingerboard. The um, top part of the, uh, this, this wood here is ebony, um, and it is, uh, there's, there's um, multiple types of wood that are used to make the instrument. Um, there's maple, spruce, and ebony are the most common. And uh, so this, this neck, the, the darker colored wood is the ebony part. Uh, the, what else? the fingerboard, so the fingerboard is the, the ebony. <laughs> so uh, the fingers, it's called the fingerboard because the fingers go all the way up. Usually not this high, but, but sometimes. Um, the upper bout, which is this little curved area here, um, and the lower bout, which is the lower curved area. Um, the bridge, so the bridge is this place where all the strings are kept on top of. I don't know if you can see that. Um, the bridge is very important, and without a bridge, we would have no sound at all. So the, the bridge is what keeps the, the strings tight uh, and gives, it, uh, gives the violin the brilliance and resonance that it has. Um, these, these are the, called the ethyls. Um, very typical of uh, any instrument in the violin family. They uh, help, um, again, with the resonance of the sounds and uh, it also amplifies the sounds um, from uh, the vibrations that are within, with, within the wood. So, um, okay, the, at the bottom here we have the fine tuners. So my violin, I only have one fine tuner and that's right here on the E string. I don't know if you can see, right here. That little, uh, this little thing I can, I can turn and it, and it makes the string either higher or lower. Um, it's called a fine tuner because it only makes tiny adjustments. Um, whereas the pegs at the top are for the big adjustments. Um, and then the tailpiece. So uh, tailpieces can come in a uh, multitude of different shapes and colors and everything. Mine is brown um, and it's in this shape right here. Um, and then my chin rest is uh, also brown and that's just because I like it that way. Uh, you, can get, you can get all types of different uh, chin rests and tail pieces. Um, and yes, uh, I think that's all I want to say about the anatomy of the violin, but okay. Moving on to the strings. So um, you can kind of see from this diagram, the G string, which is on the far uh, left in this picture is um, the lowest string. So I'll just play that for you. As you can hear, it's got a very rich, deep tone. Um, as you go up, the next string, uh, the next highest string is the D string. I like the D string personally. I think it's nice and warm sounding and um, it's, it's not quite as bright as the, the other two strings, the A string. The A string is very important because it is what we use to tune our entire orchestra. So the A string uh, is very crucial to pretty much any piece of music ever written. The A string is what, there's a lot of pieces written in A major. There's, it's, it's just a very uh, important string. And that's the second highest string. Sounds like this. And then the E string, which is the highest and brightest string. It's also the smallest string. If you can see, you might be able to see in the camera how the G string, which is this one on the, on the far uh, right for me, far left for you maybe, um, is thicker and the one in the far left is thinner. You can barely even see it. And uh, that's because the E string is very high tension and very tightly bound. And it sounds like this. So um, just, just to play them back to back, the G string, D string, A string, and then E string. 
any member of the violin family except for the double bass is tuned in fifths, which uh, it's, it's slightly different from the gamba family, which is, has all types of different tuning. The violin family is always tuned in fourths and fifths. Um, so, yes, those are the strings of the violin. Moving on to the bow. So the bow has um, definitely changed over time. As you can see, in, in 1620, I'm not even going to try to pronounce these names, but the, the shape of the bow was drastically different. Um, the frog and tip of the bow. So let's, let's do this, this slide first, <laughs> just to get acquainted with it. So we have here at the bottom, we have the frog. Uh, at the top, we have the tip. Don't ask me why it's called the frog. I had some kids ask me the other day why it's called the frog, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. So uh, I assure you there's, there's a reason, but I don't know what it is. Um, and at the frog here, we have a little screw right here, which is used to loosen or tighten the hair. Um, the hair actually is hair, and it's from a horse's tail. And uh, it goes through a whole, whole process of uh, um, getting it to the point where it's, it's white like this and, and fits into the bow. Um, but um, I thought it'd be funny to throw this in. I don't even know half of this stuff about the bow. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, and if you are a bow maker, you, you would be familiar with this. But I do not, and I don't. I just thought it was so interesting. I would throw it in here, but to be honest with you, I, this is, this is beyond my, uh, beyond my level. Um, but here, this is, I think, worth noting the different bows because um, it informs a lot of what we play as uh, string players, knowing uh, where the, uh, the music that we're playing often is, is from these time periods where they had different uh, um, device, different playing sticks and different playing violins and so there's all these different variations in what things looked like it wasn't until the like, 19th century really that bows became standardized and before that as you can see there was all kinds of different shapes and sizes um, some of them are like half the length so imagine trying to play some of these really uh, long pieces long slow pieces with only half of a bow it's, it's very tricky so um, and uh, the most recent one resembles our modern boat, the one by Viotti. Viot and uh, it, as you can see, it's very, very straight, very long. And um, the tip has no funny business. It's just a, just kind of rounded off there. Although I do like the, the look of the older boats. Um, so uh, I thought it'd be fun just to throw in some fancy violins in here, because I always get this question, and I always, I, I can see it coming from a mile away. Violins are very expensive. This is one example of one that is, was recently sold for $10 million. Um, and the reason why it's so expensive is, well, to, to, to summarize, to, to, put it, to put it shortly, um, the uh, wood that they use to make it, in this case, this was Oh man, four four hundred years old at this at this point. This violin is made from wood that is uh, no longer available. So the it, people people um, think that that has something to do with the special sound that it's able to produce. Um, and the maker, of course, Giuseppe Guarneri del Gesù, was very famous, and all of his instruments, almost all of his instruments, um, today are worth around this much, maybe not all 10 million, but uh, if you own a Del Jesu, you're doing, <clears throat> you're doing pretty well. Um, so this is one example of a Guarneri. And then of course, people know Stradivari. Uh, this is Stradivari's violin, Cota Fiaton, and it's, it's a little pixely, I'm noticing, but imagine it, imagine it not so pixely and, uh, and you know, that's fresh, fresh coat of varnish and it's, and it's, also very expensive. This one's $18 million, crazy. Um, these, these, very, these very expensive um, rare violins are uh, usually owned by museums or, or went out to professional musicians in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, 
very few of us in the Terre Haute Symphony actually get to play these, but <laughs> uh, our concert master actually has a very nice final, and I, I forget what it is exactly, but um, uh, getting, getting to, I've, I've personally played on um, a Stradivarius and a Guarneri uh, just for fun at a violin shop, and they sound amazing, and uh, they are definitely worth the price, in my opinion. I think Daniel's. I think Daniel's violin uh, is around a million. Yeah, so it's only a million. And basically. he does not own it. He won a competition uh, in which he gets to use the violin, mm. um, but he does not own it. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Most most of most uh, most people who play these violins don't own them. Um, Correct. Because they're so expensive, and we are musicians. So. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's my last slide. Yes. So. Um, should I do some questions now or should I play first? Let's go ahead and play first and then we'll, okay. we'll save questions for the end. And as, um, if anyone does think of a question as Toby's giving his presentation, feel free to go ahead and put it into the chat so that we can save it for the end. And then I'll read off questions to Toby so we can uh, make sure that we answer all of them. Yes, please. Um, so should not be sharing screen anymore. Um, Yep, we see you. We're good. Okay. So, violin excerpts are very scary. Um, well, any excerpt for any instrument is scary. Um, it, the excerpts are chosen, I don't know if people have touched on this in other presentations, they're chosen to highlight different aspects of the instrument. So, in the case of the violin, as I showed you, there are very low and um, resonant tones that you can get and then just very bright and crisp t uh, sounds you can get. So it's it's quite a contrast um, of uh, character that you're able to get on violin. Um, and so we want to hear that in auditions. One of the most famous and uh, dramatic representations of the violin is the, uh, the beginning of the Don Juan um, Overture, which is uh, pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, it's uh, bring it up. It's uh, very dramatic and very flashy, and uh, I will play you a bit of it right now. A very tricky excerpt for anyone that's not yes. familiar with it. Um, you couldn't what do, tell I was sweating the whole time. Yeah. What do audition panels listen for when you're performing that excerpt for an audition? Right. So uh, there's a couple of things. So right off the very beginning, what makes this so tricky is there's so many runs. And so this first run here is all 16th notes. And we on an audition panel, we want to hear that it is uh, that is very clear and uh, crisp and precise. So. 
we want to hear every note. So it's kind of murky down here in the G string. So really making sure that all those notes shine is really important. Um, and this happens throughout. There's, there's a million runs. It's basically one big run. So hearing every note is really important. Um, in this excerpt in particular, there's a lot of uh, very specific rhythms. So um, one such rhythm is a dotted rhythm. So. That represents a couple different types of rhythms. So there's the short clipped rhythm. And then there's a connected rhythm. And then there's a, uh, an eighth note, which is, these are all 16th notes, uh, 16th dotted figures, but then there's an eighth note dotted figure. So together it's. And hearing all those differences is very important. Um, there's also a lot of accents. So accents basically are, um, uh, there's all types of different ways to do accents. And one of the ways we don't want to hear is someone just slam on it. Like it, 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 that, that's not a very um, beautiful sound. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell on the zoom, but uh, usually for, for these accents, we want to hear a cleaner articulation. So We don't want it to hear, we don't want to hear any heavy bow sound. So by that I mean, I don't want to hear that the person is, is, is um, being too vertical with the bow. I don't, can you hear this noise when I hit the string like that? That's, that's not the kind of sound we want to hear in an audition. We want to hear very clean and precise. Um, so this, this excerpt is filled with very, um, uh, very, you know, pre precision is key. In this, in this excerpt, I would say. Also, the left hand, um, I was talking mostly about the bow and what the bow does, but the left hand also is, is um, working very hard. And um, one example would be in, uh, in this run here, where it's all slurred. Just watch my left hand. I'll try to do it for the camera. So making sure each finger is is like little tiny hammers, very uh, articulate and um, very. Uh, um, what well, my teacher used to say, forte, forte left hand always. So uh, making sure that even if you're you're lightening up with the with the with the bow, your left hand is right there, um, uh, powering through. So uh, that's Don Juan. Um, Brief, very brief presentation of Don Juan. I could go on. I, there's so many things that I wasn't happy with just now that I could, I could uh, pick apart endlessly. But uh, moving on now. So this is an excerpt I am less um, familiar with, but uh, it is, uh, it is asked for in many auditions, um, and it is the Midsummer Night's Dream uh, by Mendelssohn. It's the scherzo from the Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and this excerpt is uh, looking for a little bit of a different side of the violin. So I guess I'll play first and talk about it after. Uh, wish me luck. As a clarinetist, I think the same thing about Midsummer. <laughs> uh, I really should stand for this. To give myself the best chance. Thank <laughs> you. 
guys notice how it's very different uh, character. Like I said, it's showing a different side. So whereas the Don Juan is flashy and, and dramatic, this is um, the scherzo from the Midsummer Night's Dream is, um, I think this is the scene where there's, I know fairies. I know someone, I, some, for some reason, fairies is in my mind. So I think this is a scene where there are fairies. And so that's what I try to show through my playing that it's very light and fluttering around and, and never too heavy. Um, again, with the, with the accents at the beginning. Just a little sparkle, not so much of a uh, attack on the notes. Nothing, is, nothing in this excerpt should be um, heavy or, um, or ugly sounding. It should all be very uh, pretty and lighthearted. Um, this, this, ex this excerpt is very tricky. Um, the, probably the biggest thing I would say is the bow stroke and the control of the bow. So uh, throughout the excerpt, you probably saw me using this kind of light stroke in the upper half of the bow. Um, and that's very hard to control, especially when you're switching strings. So. I don't know if it'll be clear from the video, but watch my arm as I play. So even when I'm changing strings, I have to change my arm and how it's positioned while maintaining the same quality of sound on, this, on the short notes. So what makes this excerpt hard is that there's a lot of string changes and position changes. Um, and I have to make it sound like I'm not, like it's the easiest thing in the world. Um, just to give myself another shot at it, I'm going to play a little bit from the middle where there's a lot of these string changes. So I'm, I'm starting on the E string, but I'm also at the same time, I'm on the A string. I'm going back and forth. So I have to maintain this crisp sound and light sound while doing all these string changes, which is very tricky. Um, so that's Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, how am I doing on time? OK. Um, so yeah, um, what else can I say about this? Uh, the rhythm, I would say in general, in orchestra auditions, they are very much listening to perfect rhythm. So what that means for this excerpt is not rushing and not skipping out on any of the rests or long notes. So since so much of it is this is this um, 16th notes, uh, making sure I don't rush on anything else. So at the very beginning I have, and it's easy to rush through those notes because they're less long. So making sure I'm very disciplined with my pacing and that I don't rush through notes um, because because that's what they're listening for and I need to be very strict with myself. So practicing this with a metronome would be a good thing for me to do. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about I, it. I was gonna ask, do you have any other excerpts you wanna do? I was thinking of some things that we could share with the class. Did you sure. have another excerpt you wanna do? Uh, I can do another one or we, whatever you want, Sam. I was thinking um, when Philip did his cello um, class last time, we didn't really talk about the different types of um, extended technique, like how a harmonic is created or portamento or pizzicato or playing at the bridge and how that all, all those different ways of playing the violin. And um, I think before you go on to your solo, maybe highlight some of those different things that you might see in music. Sure. And so these kinds of things that Sammy just mentioned briefly, um, they're less common in uh, orchestra music, but they're still, they're very common in solo music and in, um, and, uh, in other works. In, uh, there's, there's many different techniques called extended techniques um, that, uh, that we use um, on a frequent basis. One of the most common is the harmonic. So, um, so you know that the G string is the lowest string. And it just so happens the, the physics of the way the, the violin is set up, if I put my finger down lightly halfway down the string, right here, if I cut the string in half from the bridge to the scroll, 
I get exactly one octopier. Clarify, he's not actually pressing down. He's just touching the string. So um, if, I, if I press my finger down, I get a solid note. And if I lift it up, I get a harmonic. Now, the differences in the harmonic series are most apparent when I break that in half. So if I go a quarter of the way, I get a, a D. And again, I'm only pushing my finger down. I'm, not, I'm right on the top of the string, and I'm not pushing it down. I, that's impossible to see in the camera. But um, And uh, these harmonics are very useful. Um, most often used up high. And um, they are very, they are used um, in many pieces as uh, an alternative to a solid note. Um, the some other techniques I think Sammy mentioned was a um, portamento. So that's one of my favorites. Um, you hear in, in any in any romantic piece, uh, ballad or. or um, you know, in the restaurant, when the two lovers are having their Italian dinner, there's the violinist too, who does a portamento. And that's, that's uh, one of my favorite things to do, but it's unfortunately not too many uh, orchestra pieces call for it. Um, although I, I have to, I have to admit, uh, uh, David Bowden does, does uh, encourage us in certain cases to use it because I think he realizes it's a a useful tool for conveying that kind of romantic feeling and express expressive uh, quality that you kind of miss if you just this is not the same and it, it's missing a little bit of uh, of juice and for warmth. Sure. Yeah. 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 So I, I love Portamenti uh, and uh, uh, I wish they were more prevalent in our repertoire, but um, uh, what were the other? What was something oh, else? Pizzicato. Pizzicato. Oh, that's another Probably. one I love. So, yeah, um, Pitts is really fun. Um, the Pitts is actually used quite often in in all kinds of music, even in Mozart. Is it's used, and that's basically you take your bow. Ooh, my bow is bent a little bit in this camera. So you take your first finger on your bow, you stick it out a little bit, and you just pluck the string. And it's really fun and cute, and it's used a lot to accompany. Um, so imagine, imagine someone's playing this beautiful, and then the accompaniment would be, and it's just very cute uh, texture that it gives. And uh, if you can imagine a whole orchestra pitzing, it's. It's a very different sound from the bowed sound. So uh, Pitts is, is, an, is a technique that's used very often in orchestra playing. Um, and it is uh, very fun to do. <laughs> uh, although it can hurt your finger after a while, especially if you're pitzing very loudly. You can, you can, you can get an yeah, injury on your finger if you're not careful. So. Um, but yes, there's also left-hand pits, which if you saw uh, Daniel Foyth's um, Last Rose of Summer from uh, a few concerts ago, he, he had some of these. So in these, in these are less strong pits because I'm kind of limited with the amount of pull I can get, but uh, I, can, it's, I can do very flashy things. Where I can mix bowing and pizzicato at the same time. So left hand pits is sometimes used to achieve a virtuosic effect. Um, and I think it's also very fun, but hard. <laughs> uh, you know, bowing. So uh, for those listening, it's uh, in the music, when they go back from pizzicato to bowing, it'll actually say arco in the music. So the word arco is the normal bowing that you're familiar with, and then it'll say pits, P-I-Z-Z, -Z, typically in the music when they're when they do pizzicato. Yes. Um, 
speaking of bowing, um, this is something we didn't talk about with Philip, um, but understanding what's an up bow versus a down bow. And sure. um, I think a lot of people don't realize um, it takes a lot of coordination. Um, one of Daniel's jobs as concertmaster is to determine bowing for the entire string section right. or for the entire violin section at least. And then he passes it on to the other principal. So can you talk a little bit about bowing sure. and what it looks like in the music? I, I like to try to trick my um, kids that I teach with, because they're also learning how the difference between up bows and down bows. So I start very easy and I say, what is this? And they say, up bow. And I, and I go down and they're like, down bow. But then what do I do when I'm on the G string? And imagine I'm playing like this and I'm horizontal all of a sudden. You know, it's, it's less clear at this point. So um, I like to imagine that up, down, and then you up, down, you slowly work your way over, up, down, until you're here, and then it's up and then down. So the up bow is um, from the tip to the frog. If you remember my diagram that I showed earlier, it's always from the upper half of the bow, so anywhere in this area, to the lower half, so anywhere in this area. Um, and a down bow is the opposite, so anywhere in this area, near the frog, to anywhere in this area, the tip. So um, down bows and up bows sometimes are very hard to distinguish, as in the Midsummer Night's Dream. They're very small bows, but if you look closely, it starts with the down bow. Uh, you can't really see. Down bow, up bow, down bow, up bow. And then very fast, it's just up bows and down bows back to back. So um, one of the things that people might not realize that's actually very tricky to do is having multiple down bows in a row. So it's, it's one of the most feared techniques of all violin playing is the down bow. Uh, and then it's its cousin, the up bow. Ah, there we go. <laughs> um, so most of the time, when you see me slurring, um, that is a uh, sustained down bow across multiple notes with the left hand. So, but I can do the same thing on an up bow. Um, and that's something I just kind of skipped over because I, I didn't think about it. But up bows and down bows are very, um, we, we live by the up bows and down bows. There's no, there's no other bow. <laughs> and what are the symbols that you see in your music for up bow versus the, down bow? Because um, I always found this so confusing. It is very confusing. <laughs> yes. So uh, here's an example of a down bow right here. Oh, that looks kind of blurry. Is it blurry for you? It's a little blurry. Back up just a little bit. So um, or if you just have a piece of paper, you can draw it out. Oh yeah, th that's a little better. So, so this, it's, this symbol right here is a down bow. It's, it's essentially a square without the bottom. Yes. So that's and a down then, bow. And then an up oh, bow. One. Uh, where's an up bow? Let me find one for you. Uh, here's an up bow. <laughs> So up, upside down carrot. Yes. Right so an upside down carrot, even though it looks like an arrow that's pointing down, actually means up bow. Yeah. And these come from the, the how the bow looks. So the tip looks like a triangle, essentially. So that means you start from the tip and go up. And the square that has no line on the bottom is supposed to look like the frog. So you start from the frog and go down. So I learned all of this from working in the music library at, at IU. And yeah. I, you know, as a wind player, that's, that was totally confusing to me. <laughs> yeah, so Dan, part of Daniel's job is to just mark these symbols in, in his part. And then uh, we, all, we all copy those symbols into our, in our page so that, so that I'm not at the tip when he's at the frog, because then I'll be, everyone will notice that I'm, I'm off from the rest of the section. And so I don't want that to happen. So I try to follow his bowings all the time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. All right. Great. You want to move on to your solo or solo sure, piece? Sure, yes. Whatever, or, yeah. Yeah. So uh, for my solo, I picked um, the Rondo by Mozart. It's from, um, it's an arrangement that uh, Chrysler made of this Rondo. Um, 
and it's a fun, fun, fast piece, um, lively piece. Let me just get my music stand set up. Okay. And see if you can notice some of the techniques that that uh, that I talked about uh, today.
go. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I've got a huge list of questions for you from folks. Everyone's so curious to learn about you and more about the violin. Okay. So uh, the first question comes from uh, Sherry Daly, who is uh, on our board. Okay. Um, she asks, uh, would the pricey violin sound different to those of us who aren't necessarily trained? Does the $10 million violin really sound that much better? Um, to, some, to someone that's, that's an untrained ear or an untrained sure, ear? Yeah, just a, a, a typical audience member. Do you think someone could really hear the difference? I think someone would hear the difference side by side. Um, okay. Maybe not, maybe not uh, so much. Um, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's very important who is playing the violin. Let's make that very clear that um, uh, a very expensive violin is not going to sound nearly as good if it's played by um, my roommate, you know, if, if he doesn't <laughs> play violin. Uh, but, but no, I, I, think, I think you would hear the difference if they were played side by side. Okay. All right. And then um, how much does your violin cost? I knew that question was going to come. <laughs> That's been a very popular <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, my, my violin um, was made in 2010 by a, uh, a maker in San Francisco, California. And uh, my violin is, he, he is not as famous as Stradivari or Guarneri, uh, but I think he did a pretty dang good job. Um, and this, this violin was uh, 20,000. So still okay. a hefty chunk of change for sure. It is, but, yeah, it's, but, that's uh, a car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, only yeah. 20,000. Only 20,000, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, Betsy Frank, who is uh, one of our longtime supporters, she also asked, can you talk about the difference between first, first violin and second violin and how those uh -huh. two different parts kind of interact with each other? I would love to because uh, as it happens, I am a second violinist in a string quartet. So um, I get to contemplate my existence on a daily, <laughs> daily uh, level. So Great way to put it. Um, the, the reason I have I exist, as I've come to realize, is to um, support and highlight the things that in the score that the composer can't convey through the first violin part alone. So the first violin part, of course, has most of the melodies. Um, so that's pretty self-evident and self-explanatory. The second violin part, I think, is more um, interesting because we we do a little bit of everything. <laughs> so. Um, the first violin is playing this gorgeous tune, and the second violin part maybe has something like this. So I just made that up, but that's, I guarantee you that there's a piece where that is, if not exactly what's written, something like that. So um, the, reason, the reason why I think it leaves more room to um, well, not more room, but why, why I think it's interesting to, to zero in on the second violin part here is listen to the, the chords. So maybe the first violin is going like. And then the second violin's role there is to highlight the interesting part of the tune. So. Um, I find that most of my effort when I'm playing in a quartet is um, through recognizing these little things that I can bring out, whether it's a har harmony or a special note that I want to bring attention to. As long as I don't steal the show, I think it's, it's our second violinist's duty to sort of do the most they can with what, what their part is. I don't know right. if I answered your question at all, but no, it's, it's I something I, I think about a lot. So I think that's a really great way to put it. I mean, it's not just a supportive role. It does a lot of other things. And um, David Bowden, with the symphonies that he conducts, does something very interesting in the placement of the first and second violinists. He often places them on opposite sides um, so that they can kind of speak to each other and can create a stereo effect. Yeah. Um, a lot of orchestras put all the violins right next to each other, and it's kind of hard to discern between second and first. So that is something that I think um, our conductor in the Terre Haute Symphony tries to bring out, which mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. Yeah. Um, do violinists tend to experience neck and shoulder problems as a result of holding the instrument? Oh, yeah. Big time. Um, I think um, 
I, I myself have had a few uh, uh, ongoing struggles with this. Um, I've figured out ways to mitigate it and, and improve my quality of, of comfort, but uh, the reality is that this is just not a natural way to put our body. So the fact that my arm is all the way over here and that my shoulder and, and my neck are kind of locked in here is not, not very, um, you can't really relax. So mm -hmm. we do the best we can by just letting it sit here and loosen our shoulders and all this. But um, I know plenty of people who have had these issues and um, uh, there, there are things you can change. I, I, I don't know if I talked about this, but here's, here's my shoulder rest. And it's kind of got a cushion on it. So this goes, this is what pads. Otherwise, I would just have wood on my shoulder. So that's not very comfortable. But this makes it slightly better. Um, this uh, shoulder rest with the, with the padding. Um, and there are other things you can do. You can get little um, strips of cloth and, and things to, to help protect your, your jaw and your shoulder. So You'll um, notice a lot of violins tend to have like a callus or a mark yep. underneath. Yeah, see how right his... You can yep. see yeah. So you can pretty much tell if somebody's a violinist if they have that mark. <laughs> That's the mark of that's a mark of a violinist or a violist. Yes. Yes, or a violist. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, can you talk a little bit about the pieces that were required on the audition for the Terre Haute Symphony? Let me see if I can pull up. You can bring that up. Yeah, it's I auditioned three years ago, so my memory's a little hazy. But yes, um, uh, I'm sure. I believe Don Juan was. I'm sure on Don Juan was on there. Don Juan is on every audition ever. So yes, and I think um, Mozart forty. Is that no, right. maybe I think so? Um, let me see if I can. Uh, oh, here I got the concert master. So um, the audition rep is a little bit different depending on exactly which position you're you're auditioning for. So if you're auditioning for concert master, the list is much longer and more involved because that's a big leadership position. If you're auditioning for a section violin, there's going to be many of the same audition excerpts that are on a concert master audition, but less because it's it's not a leadership position. So our principal roles, um, including associate concert master or assistant concert master, are going to have a little bit more demanding list than just a a general section violin audition. So um, typically on Terre Haute Symphony auditions um, for the strings, um, they'll do a concerto movement of their choice. Um, and then they'll do one movement of a Bach unaccompanied solo. So uh, those of you that were with us for uh, Philip Kettler's presentation last week, he did the prelude from Bach's cello suite number one, which is the famous one we hear in every single wedding and <laughs> all of those. Um, and then they'll have orchestral excerpts. So it's it's uh, Mozart Symphony 39. That's the one that's the, the big excerpt. Um, Beethoven Symphony Number no. Nine. So, for those of you who know "Ode to Joy," that's where that melody comes from. The fourth movement of Beethoven Symphony Number no. Nine, um, Brahms Symphony Number no. One, uh, Strauss Don Juan, which is what Toby played for us, um, Strauss Ein Heldenleben. I'm not as familiar with that one. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just scrolling down through here. There's 12 pages of the Concertmaster audition excerpts. So these are very long, involved excerpts uh, in, in particular. So, um, okay, uh, okay. so now some of the uh, more personal questions. When did you begin playing violin? Um, you know, I got it when I was four, and then I started lessons when I was five. So um, a long time ago. So pretty young. Yeah, string players and pianists often start at a very young age. Wind players are not going to start their instruments until they're 10, 11, or 12 years of age, um, just mostly because of the size. Um, one thing to note, though, if you are a string player starting at the age of four, they do make small violins and small cellos to start out on. You don't start on a full-size violin, uh, correct? One of, one of my friends, his... Uh... His, this was many years ago, but his brother started playing, he wanted to play cello, but he was so small that even the smallest cello wouldn't work. So they used a viola and he just played, <laughs> if you can imagine, this is a, a little bit bigger, but not much. And he would just put this on the ground and, and play it like a cello. And oh it was very God. adorable. And uh, yeah, I think he was three <laughs> years old or something. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and then where did you go to undergrad? I don't remember if you mentioned that. Uh, I went to Oberlin uh, Conservatory in Ohio. Okay. And then you did your master's at IU. And then I did my master's at okay. IU. And then I am currently uh, with my quartet doing a uh, performance diploma here at IU, um, specializing in chamber music. Okay. Are you guys the Kuttner Quartet? Uh, we were we were last year. Um, last year. I, I don't know if we still are, but we're, we're the quartet in residence here. At okay. Okay. All right. Um, so for everyone that's listening, um, the Kuttner Quartet is kind of the, you audition as a quartet for this position uh, as string quartet in residence of the Jacobs School of Music at IU. Um, and so when you win that position, um, it's very prestigious. Uh, so uh, Toby is part of a quartet that did that. Um, his quartet, uh, called the Dior Quartet, also won the bronze medal at the Fischoff International Chamber Music Competition a couple of years ago. And uh, that's an extremely prestigious chamber music competition. Uh, it's extremely competitive for string quartets, particularly. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, do your fingers have calluses or blisters or how do you guys deal with that as you're kind of starting to play violin? Right, um, my fingers, um, I think um, I used to get really bad uh, blisters and calluses and I think through years and years, I don't even want to count how many years I've been playing, I don't, I can do the math, I just don't want to do it, but the, the, the flesh right here that I, that I play on, I play every day and I think I've just developed um, a uh, immunity uh, I wouldn't call it a callus because it's not a thick. It, I don't. I don't think it's very thick skin, but it, it's very tough skin, and um, so I don't. I don't really get any kind of cuts or pain anymore on my tips of the fingers. So um, I know people that get really bad calluses. Um, I guess I'm lucky that I don't have those, but um, it's as you can see, it's not too bad. I, I uh, the other violinist in my quartet, her her fingers are all cut up, and uh, she has she has to put you know, special creams and stuff on our fingers to keep them so they don't bleed. So, yeah. Huh, interesting. Okay. Um, what are your favorite pieces to play? Favorite pieces to play? Um, if you're familiar with the composer and violinist Fritz Chrysler, um, you should check him out. He's, he's, uh, he wrote a lot of, uh, I guess you would call it like salon music, kind of what I was talking about earlier with like the, the romantic dinner, Italian dinner with the slides and the violin. That's, that's like, that's uh, textbook Chrysler right there. Um, and I think uh, a lot of his music is really fun to play. So if you have a free afternoon sometime, just search, search on, uh, on YouTube, search for Chris Chrysler uh, and just enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Did, I believe, um, Daniel, for the Music in Bloom, did he play a piece by Chrysler? Yes. Yes. I think he did, yeah. So if you, um, if you guys are on our YouTube page, um, find our full performance of Music in Bloom uh, from our May 2020. That was our live streamed concert. And Daniel's first on the program, and the piece that he plays is a Fritz Chrysler piece. So he, he composed quite a bit for the violin. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, what other instruments do you play, if any? And then uh, how old were you and why did you choose the violin? Well, I assume that question is partly due to the fact that there's a piano behind me. But yes. uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. I do play piano. Um, not not like classically or uh, professionally by any means, but I, I like to improvise on piano in my free time. Uh, and I chose violin um, in my senior year of high school, kind of last minute because uh, I always I always enjoyed playing violin and, and piano. At, that, at the time when I was choosing um, my college and what I wanted to do, um, I was kind of, uh, just, I was choosing between a lot of things. I was on the swim team, I was playing for violin, I was playing piano, I, I had big decent grades. Both my brothers went to Ivy League colleges, so I felt, I felt this pressure from all, all different directions, but I eventually chose to go with violin because I think I enjoy it the most out of everything and uh, I'm glad I did. <laughs> um, and then is there a difference between a uh, violin yes, and fiddle? Yes, it is much easier to carry the violin. That's a good point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there a difference between violin and fiddle? There is not. Yeah. 
Uh, this is also a question I get all the time. And uh, I have no problem with people calling it the fiddle. People apologize for, for calling it the fiddle. I think it's, it's fine. And, and fiddle music is violin music and violin music is fiddle music. It's, it's, all, it's all the same. It's all fun. It's, it's just yeah. a different style of playing. Yeah, fiddle, I would say fiddle playing is, is uh, I, wish, I wish I could whip up a fiddle tune for you, but it's, it's <laughs> honestly, it, it's very, I see a lot of similarities between that and some of the music I play today. Like, it's, it's very like bouncy and, and lighthearted and fun. And um, I, I, think, I think they're becoming more and more the same thing. So bluegrass, fiddle, it's all, it's all violin. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we're about five minutes over. Thank you so much for joining us, Toby. This was wonderful to kind of get to know you and, and about the violin. Um, I'll give a quick plug. Our next presentation is going to feature our principal percussionist, Keegan Sheehy, um, on December 8th. And the time is 5.30 p.m. He is not available at 1 p.m. because he works at IU in the scheduling office. So he's going to join us at 5.30 p.m. on December 8th um, from his home studio. And he's going to take us through all of the standard percussion instruments. And then he's going to end with a marimba solo. Um, again, a shout out for Music in Bloom. He was also featured in Music in Bloom um, as a uh, marimba soloist. Um, and Toby and one of our other um, violinists, Yuri Santos, also did a duo as part of the Music in Bloom as well. So I highly recommend check that out on our YouTube page. Um, we do post all of these presentations on our YouTube page. So if there's ever one that you want to share with somebody or watch it again or catch up on one you missed, you can go to our YouTube page. I recommend that you subscribe so that you know when we up upload new videos um, and you can watch these as many times as you want. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, Toby. Good to see everybody. Bye everybody. Thanks for